Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 599. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. Today's May 26th, 2020. All right, you can tell by our black backgrounds we both have, it's going to be a depressing show. George is depressed. I'm depressed. We're sick of COVID. We're sick of this pandemic. I think we're we're like 25 weeks into it, maybe 52 weeks in. It's been a long time, George. I'm losing all sense of time, and uh, I just i am tired of it. Is it over yet? Somebody's selling the owl clear. Can we come out of our caves? <sighs> Although... Now that I'm watching more and more in the press, I'm kind of afraid what's coming. I don't know if you saw this picture from the pool in the Ozarks where, you know, there's a thousand people in a swimming pool. Here in the New Jersey beaches, people are running to the beach and they're not really wearing their mask. And uh, I'm not sure we're ready to come out of this uh, COVID shutdown or lockdown in a responsible fashion, George. That's the key word, responsible fashion. There's so much conflicting medical advice. Uh, I was watching the cable news last night and they had one uh, fellow on from the Heritage Foundation who is an esteemed medical uh, type saying this is all overblown, we should open up immediately, followed by another one from Columbia University saying no, it's dangerous, don't do what these things this fellow said. So how am I a layman uh, supposed to take this? We are having some openings in Florida. I've been to the barber shop. Susan went yesterday to the nail salon. And I mention this because Susan gets all of her news and information, not from cable TV, but from beauticians. (laughs) Good. (laughs) What what did she learn? She learned, and this is a a point of fear for me. The beautician is an independent contractor. She has been out of work for two months. She has an 11-year-old child at home and to come back and the schools are all closed and there's no daycare or anything like that. She has had to come back to work basically just five because she's been without income. As an independent contractor, she couldn't get unemployment insurance. There are ways to sort of tap the government funds, but they've all been used by the major corporations who sort of uh, hug the trough, so to speak. And she, uh, had to uh, homeschool her ch- her 11 year old with her gra- with her parents while she's working and she's just about underwater she's basically she she's uh insolvent and how many uh small businessmen and women across the united states uh barbers beauticians people with small businesses i went into the dry cleaners the other day and I was chatting with a lady, and I was the only customer she had that morning. Um, now, here we have our seasonal pattern, and half of our people, once the lockdown is closed and they're allowed to go back to New York and New Jersey, they're going to leave. And so they've missed the season uh, uh, financially. Well, I mean, that's one of the biggest keys here. And I'm a self employed business person, I cannot collect unemployment. If all my customers closed and my buzz, my business shutters, I can't go to the Connecticut unemployment office and say, oh, where's my check? I want my $600 because as self-employed people, we don't pay into the unemployment system and we can't even buy into the unemployment system. It's just not available to us. When you're, you as a self-employed person go bust, it's called bankruptcy. And uh, that's a, a sad reality. I think at this point, 18 to 20 percent of small businesses are going to go under Uh, i was on the craigslist where people list their businesses for sale and it's loaded uh, from salons beautician nail places um, a couple bars you know they're just out they they're selling uh, what assets they have left and uh, especially the new ones there's some businesses that are 15 20 30 years old that may survive this but i think anything uh, under seven years old is not going to have the uh, reserves to overcome uh, this everlasting pandemic and it's a hard reality because these people as business people can't just file for unemployment and 
the pastoral, my pastoral work has really changed over the past two months. At the beginning, it was basically assuaging people's fears, helping those few people who needed financial help to get groceries and things like that. That has sort of reached its own level. People aren't really as panicked as, as they once were. And we've kicked in with all the social welfare programs the church can do to help people. But in the past few weeks, well, last week or so, I've been getting calls about people feeling suicidal. People, you know, marriages are coming unfrayed. Uh, that uh, I think we're going to see when this is done, I think the divorce lawyers are going to be uh, in for a windfall. Um, that the, the psychological, and I guess you could say the knock-on effect from that of health, concerns of people who have the world has stopped for two months now and it may be another month before it's fully up to speed is playing out uh, in a very difficult way here well you had mentioned when we started that there's just no way to know what's the truth did we overreact with the lockdown are we not going far enough and one of the reasons for that is we have an ineffective press I don't find journalism is serving us in any way during this pandemic. Uh, if you're watching the Fox News, the CNNs and all that, it's just, you know, 24-7, oh my God, please watch us because you should be scared to death and you should not stop watching us. Uh, CNN uh, is all the conspiracy theories. MSNBC is don't take that little uh, mosquito pill uh, Fox News is there's nothing wrong here. Continue on. Let the people out of their houses. And nobody's being served well. And I saw there's a little controversy going on over in the UK with a politician who works for the new prime minister taking his grand his son to see grandma and grandpa. This is a uh... It's truly an insular British story. It really has no resonance outside of the UK. Um, frankly, it's one of these things I couldn't care less, but it does point to a deeper, deeper malaise, deeper issue. A man named Dominic Cummings, who's an advisor to Prime Minister Boris Johnson, took his four-year-old son who has autism up from his home in London to his parents' house in Durham so that the child could be cared for while the government minister does all the things he needs to do. Now, Britain has in place rules that prevent unnecessary travel. And this was deemed by some as being unnecessary travel. Right, and deemed so by the, the media, press. Yeah, I mean, it was deemed by the press to be unnecessary. Therefore, we're going to make sure this guy never works again, can never work again. He's demonized for life. It's atrocious what I'm watching, George. Well, as I said, you know, this is just, you know, British political culture. They do that to each other. Uh, and there's not much for me to comment that is of any relevance because I'm not British and <laughs> I have no skin in the game. Well, every once in a while, I, where I, 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 well, hold on. Every once in a while, I, I hear an Oxford accent come out. You can't say you're not completely. No, I, I, well, let's not go there. Uh, <laughs> no, but I guess where I'm coming from is um, what gets me is. Uh, the bishops, some bishops of the Church of England have taken to social media to join in the lynch mob. Yeah. And that strikes a chord with me. And it's it, the chord is inappropriate. Yeah. Um, in other words, saying the bishop of, uh, I think it was Manchester, saying uh, we can't work with the government anymore because this man won't keep his solemn commitments and promises. Uh, our friend uh, David Old in New Zealand on, on the Twitter says, well, now that you have a problem about not keeping solemn promises, what are you going to do about all the clergy the gay, who, who violate the uh, gay bans and things yeah. like that? What are you going to do about Justin Welby, who put in this rule that nobody over 60 can work in hospitals? He's 63 and he's visiting hospitals. The rules don't apply to him. Well, we talked about this and we roasted Justin Welby perhaps a little too unfairly, because I'm sure his motives were pure, just the execution was pretty bad. Just like but his politicians' bishop, motivations were, were just fine. Is the bishop, should bishops be engaged in sort of free-for-all 
And from an American perspective, their behavior is absolutely atrocious. They would be censured. By, uh, the uh, informed opinion would give them a raspberry and turn their backs on them saying, choose between politics and faith. How are you building the kingdom of God? How are you leading people to Christ? Well, I think it's sort of a silly question because I can't think of many bishops of the Church of England who would qualify as being workers for Christ. They're Oh, I should, I'm sounding sarcastic and jaded, and I'm guilty of what they're guilty of, <laughs> of casting aspersions. For, but it sort of it sort of plays into this understanding of British bishops being absolutely useless. Well, they don't think... say anything about abortion. They'll say plenty of Dominic Cummings. They won't say anything about the moral issues of the day, but they sound off on party political issues. Uh, Keith Broadbent, the Bishop of Williston, uh, got into an internet uh, spat with another priest in the Church of England, a viewer of our show who sent this to me. And the Bishop of uh, Williston's response was basically to give him the middle finger and block him. This is the Bishop of Williston blocking a clergyman of the Church of England who's taking a raw, a calm, rational, casual approach. And the Bishop of Williston responds, well, I'm not going to talk to any Tory scum. How can how can you take this man seriously as a Christian leader? Come on now. Well, and that's what's happening here. It was like four weeks ago we started announcing that the bishops were talking about having layoffs of deacons and some clergy over in the UK because well, got to save some money somewhere. Last week I heard uh, little rumors. Well, maybe we should lay off some bishops. It wasn't a day later that these bishops start making a lot of noise. Hey, we belong here. We'll be that political if you need. We'll make. We have comments and opinions. Give us Twitter, we will give you the world. Nicholas Helen, who writes for the Sunday Times, had an exclusive story mm -hmm. where he talked to some of the bishops who attended the recent House of Bishops meeting. This little bit was not in their official press release, which we published on Anglican Inc. Nicholas, it took Nicholas Helen to ferret it out. And the Archbishop designate of York, uh, Stephen Cottrell, or Cottrell, Cottrell yeah. forget how it's supposed to be pronounced, is going to head up a task force to look into slimming down the hierarchy of the Church of England. Right now, they have twice as many bishops as they did during Victorian times, and their presence <laughs> on the national stage, I think, is a factor of 10 negative, not doubled. So, in other words, there are going to be some cuts, redundant bishops, and frankly, the staff is so bloated, so unnecessary for the proclamations of the gospel, this is a no-brainer, but who's going to be willing to give up their jobs? Which which diocese are they going to amalgamate when somebody, they're going to do it when somebody retires. They just won't fill the spot and squeeze it into a neighboring diocese or something. But well, it, it's about time that they looked into the realities of their generational malfeasance in f failing to do the work of Christ as leaders. Well, they had to do that in the Episcopal Church. They've joined some dioceses together, I assume, that in the COVID is going to allow this to happen over in the England too, where uh, they're going to jo join and uh, meld some of these dioceses together, especially the failing ones. One of our one of our viewers uh, from the diocese of Southwark, South London, and the surrounding suburbs said that up to seventy percent of uh, some some of the deaneries, uh, especially in the urban areas, may not reopen. Hmm. May, because they will not have the cash flow to sustain a stipendary priest, and they're going to have to either move to a retired priest or non-stipendary clergy, or have some fellow cover 12 churches just to keep the doors open. All right. That's um, enough. Well, hold on. We, we, we've done enough bad news, George. We, we, we've, we've, we've justified having black screens on. Let's move to some good news. Fort Worth has had victory in court. Uh, this goes way back, and uh, if you've been a viewer of Anglican Scripture for the, our 10 years, you know that uh, San Juan Keen, Fort Worth, South Carolina, Quincy, a whole bunch of dioceses have had to fight the Episcopal Church in court when they decide to leave. And they said, well, we're leaving the Episcopal Church, we're taking our property with us. Neutral principles in uh, U.S. law allow us to do this. Oh, the Episcopal Church, we have the Dennis Canon. Yes, you are your own church unless you try to leave 
we have a, a little law that in our can is that won't let, let you. The Supreme Court of Texas says, uh, uh, there's no dentist can in here. If you want to take your property and leave, guess what? To get to, George. I would actually call this the vindication of Alan Haley. Yes. In a unanimous decision, the Texas Supreme Court basically wrote an opinion that is taken from Alan Haley's work for the last 10 years. And, you know, Al, uh, Alan Haley laid out the, uh, the legal principles at issue mm -hmm. and how so many judges in California and New York and Virginia have just decided to uh, abdicate their responsibilities and just say whatever the Episcopal Church nationally wants is fine without looking at the actual laws and history. And so the Texas Supreme Court, in a unanimous decision, and I need to repeat that, unanimous decision. This isn't like South Carolina, where you have such a screwy decision, that, but uh, five different judges saying five different things, and nobody knows what it means. Texas is clear and unambiguous. There is nothing to prevent a diocese from withdrawing from the Episcopal Church. We look to the property deeds. We look to the corporate law. We look to those things that are within the purview of civil law. And the Jack Eicher, Bishop Reed, Ryan Reed Diocese is the lawful owner of its property. This, now the U.S., the diocese, the Episcopal Church nationally can appeal this to the U.S. Supreme Court, but it's highly unlikely that this will be taken up further given the, uh, well, actually, let's put it this way. It may be taken up by the U.S. Supreme Court, and I think the, the Episcopal Church probably would not want to have that happen because it will see Illinois Texas have come down squarely for the diocese over the national church using, California New using, York yeah, Pennsylvania using have the, come down squarely on the national church but because they so, I mean, yeah, I know but citing neutral principles citing that you can own your land and, and nobody can take it away from you uh, that allowed Illinois so, and Texas to be victorious. And so there are uh, conflicting state interpretations of federal law. And the U.S. Supreme Court has did not take up the Virginia church cases uh, controversy, um, which was the last time, I'm, if I'm correct, it was kicked up that far up the stairwell, the Truro and uh, Falls Church fights. But if it gets kicked up there, it's more than likely uh, that uh, if I read Alan Haley correctly, the U.S. Supreme Court will side with the, on the diocesan side because the law is pretty clear, mm -hmm. and there's not a lot of reason to. And with the with the uh, U.S. Supreme Court tending to be more conservative in recent years, and it's well, that trajectory is going to continue. It's not going to change. It very well may be that if it's taken up by the U.S. Supreme Court, we finally get a national decision uh, looking at, uh, I think it's Jones versus Wolf, if yep. I'm correct. Wolf was the one. Yeah. That basically settles settles this issue. And the way the cards are being dealt right now wouldn't be to the Episcopal Church's benefit. However, as Alan Haley has pointed out, and do read his work on this, it's the final word, is, in my opinion. Absolutely. The Episcopal Church has spent almost $100 million on legal fees and stuff. And they've got more money to spend. Yes, they do. <laughs> and uh, as we saw in the O.J. Simpson case, it really does matter who you pay to be your yeah, attorney. Oh, my gosh, yeah. I mean, it's sometimes it's not about the law. It's about the attorney. And so a good, a good attorney can get you off. Um, let's go back to some... Uh, well, here's, here's the other thing. Yeah. Uh, every Episcopal case that has gone the right way for the diocese has been one I've not been involved with. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I mean, okay. I've been an expert witness in California and New yeah. York and South Carolina, and they all got nailed right off the box on the uh, uh, directed verdict on the uh, Genesis Cannon point. Yeah, so Dennis Cannon, they yeah. were smart not to pick me. As one of their expert witnesses on canon history of canon law. All right, we have two more topics. We actually have time for one. Um, we were going to talk about you know 
churches are starting to open the doors and think about how are we going to bring people back together. Do you want to say that one for Friday, or do you want to talk about that now, or we could talk about uh, that's going to uh, be an ongoing. That's going to be an ongoing issue. Sure. It's, well, let's let's just hit up real quick then. Um, our church is having the discussions. What are we going to do now? Uh, the government's starting the phase one, phase two, maybe phase three. They'll let us uh, have church services again. How is that going to look? How are we going to do that? Um, here in Connecticut, they're saying you can let 25% of your congregants in at a time. Uh, you're down to a quarter capacity instead of 100%. You have to wear a mask. You can't uh, exchange uh, hugs, kisses, and, and have your, your peace greetings. And that's a lot of discussions that we have to have is how is church going to look in July or August and how is that going to change throughout the year? Because I was at a, a wedding ceremony on Sunday and where we initially had the six feet social distancing as we were more and more comfortable with each other, it was four feet and three feet. It's just, it's the mental human brain that says, uh, I want to be around people. I want to congregate. I want this interaction. And I know there's laws that say, or laws, uh, executive orders that say we can't do it, but it's just natural, George. And churches where natural well, loving kindness happens the most. Well, for most Episcopal churches uh, outside the Diocese of Central Florida, the 25 capa capacity is not going to be an issue. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Thanks, George. They might dream of getting 25% capacity. I'm at 90% capacity. Uh -huh. uh, well, I was before all this happened. Mm -hmm. So what this means is the vestry is meeting on Wednesday, and basically we're going to look at having a service at 8, 9, 10, 11, and at 5 in the afternoon on Sundays plus our Saturday service just to because we you know we, we're basically going to have only 30 to 35 people at a time and at the only way to do that is by having more services and, um, and they have to be but services here, my great fear is nobody's going to come yeah well it's also services you have to sign up for you can't offer five services. In normal terms, you can offer four or five services, and people just kind of have, they know when they're going to come. If they come to an overflow one, they'll go to the next service and stuff like that. Here, we have to have people sign up because our church hasn't had two services ever. We're going to have an 8.30 and a 10. Well, who's going to come to the 8.30? we got to make sure that the videographer comes to the 10 because we're taping the 10. We don't want the videographer and the sound guys only coming to the 8.30. I mean, there's a whole logistical order now that has to exist for attending services that didn't, uh, wasn't needed 10 weeks ago. We've, we've been given, uh, from the diocesan offices, we've been given some helpful, unhelpful uh, guidelines. We've been given some orders, which is nobody's opening until June. And then it's up to you when you reopen. But when you reopen, please follow these guidelines. Some of them make perfect sense, and we'll attempt to follow 25% capacity. Sure. Uh, everybody wears masks, no bathrooms, no coffee hour, no Sunday schools. No, no peace. Exchanging the peace, shaking hands. And then they're asking us to basically uh, if somebody violates these rules to escort them out of the building. If somebody uh, does have COVID, has, you know, has the temperature, take their temperature and basically report them. And my experience of telling our church what to do has been that it's a waste of time. <laughs> for, five, for six years, I have been asking people, when you come into the church, please be quiet and respectful. This is the Lord's house. Mm -hmm. Do you think it matters one whit? People see each other, they chat, the mm -hmm. noise. It's now every so often I'll go, shh, but Kevin, they're not gonna listen. No, they're not. And, and the, how can you how can you tell an eighty five year old woman you gotta leave? You got to keep your mouth shut. You can't hug your friend they haven't seen in two months. She's going to do what she's going to do. Well, and the four ladies from the Bridge Club have already violated COVID in the parking lot when they were coming into church. I mean, it's just, how are you going to, you can't. And this is going to be no man's land for the church. They've never been here before. They don't know how to uh, put down these type of 
logistical rules for don't have fun, don't touch, barely worship, Eucharist sanitarily. I mean, it, oh, it's going to be crazy. No, no, no congregational. Sin. See, we. Uh, we talked about this in the pre-show, Kevin. Uh, mm -hmm. I mentioned that uh, we've been asked not to have congregational singing. And you mentioned that this, that is going around, but when you actually dig down deep into it, where's the evidence? Yeah. Uh, and th there's the problem is we go back to the, the violent press. You know, all we have at the international levels is the press just trying to get you to read their articles. They're not doing any good research and stuff like that. Unsourced articles here and there. Oh, it's crazy. And this is the time for crazy, George. Uh, do we got a couple minutes here? You want to talk about Rabbi? Let's see. We got, all right, we got four minutes. Let's let's hit uh, Ravi Zachariah. Uh, obviously, if you've been on Facebook or you've heard the news, he passed on. He was a wonderful, great apologist. And like all the rest of us, he is a fallen individual. And uh, I think he, what, what, once he died, the left and underserved said, we're going to just promote the fallen part. Yeah, I met Ravi Zacharias uh, when at an ACNA uh, assembly. Sure. I forget which one it was, but he was yeah. one of the guest speakers. Mm -hmm. Wonderful speaker, a charming man. I mean, I didn't spend any personal sure, private no, time with no. him, but... He, uh, he really gave a wonderful message of love and faith in Jesus Christ. He's died. And some of the nasty people are coming out with their knives saying he inflated his resume. He called himself doctor. Well, he didn't earn a PhD. He had 10 honorary doctorates. Or he, he's... It... I just think it's unnecessary <laughs> well, um, I, to, to think that Ravi Zacharias had to be a perfect human being before you, you could listen to his words about Christ and salvation. He mm -hmm. never claimed to be perfect. No, and he he was a wonderful apologist. Um, he really understood uh, the philosophy behind what he was uh, defending. He was a, a very smart, rich individual. And if you want to just look for flaws, yeah, he had flaws. When I die, you're going to find all my flaws. Basically, I, I left click too much. I'm, I'm not a right clicker like the rest of us. Well, I think on the one hand, we have the the Billy Graham problem. Uh, Billy Graham was such an exemplar. He was mm. so, he was one uh, in a million, one in 300 million. <laughs> yeah, six billion. And so people compare his son to Billy, and Franklin gets involved in po political politics the mm. way Billy didn't. Yeah. And so when Franklin leads a crusade, I, and I encourage my people to go, uh, I have people in the congregation saying, well, we're not going because he is over. I said, well, just put that to one side and listen to his message about Jesus Christ. And some people can't do that. And mm -hmm. it's a shame, really, that we're not able to separate the sort of secondary issues from the primary issues of salvation mm -hmm. in Christ and Christ alone. All right. This is episode 599. When we did 499, we suggested, hey, we're going to do something special for the uh, 500th episode, and we're going to do something special also for the 600th episode. If you would be so kind, please uh, give us a small video clip of where you're from, uh, how long you watch the show, your name, uh, and send it to us. We're going to include it in next or this week's episode. I need them before Thursday of this week because I want to tape on Friday and do edits. I'm going to tell you right now, uh, there's a billion different video formats out there, and I can probably just do 10 or 12. So if you found your clip didn't show, uh, make it to the show, it's just because it, I didn't have time to make it work or get back to you to get a different clip. Uh, it would really be nice if you're a bishop or an archbishop or a cardinal, even a pope, if you want to send us a, uh, a quick message. We're, we're up for that, George. Um, nothing wrong with uh, Pope Francis saying hi. I'm Pope Francis, this is the Vatican. I love Anglican script. That's how you do it, guys. So if you guys would send us your messages, we will include them in episode 600. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. You've been watching episode 599 of Anglican Unscripted.